It sounds like you're saying that this time is significant, but it's one in which the outcome could... I mean, you, you're not you're not sort of saying we're talking about a, an awakening here where we become spiritually, you know, uh, awake and grow. You think we're actually perhaps devolving? Well, I don't believe in a we, first of all. So the question needs to be sort of rephrased in a way. I do believe that there will be an awakening for those individuals who have, like remember we said earlier on about being shaken up, but the yeah. waking up process is a personal. So there, there is no doubt in my mind, I talk to them every day, that there are individuals out there who are deeply passionate about change. They have zero tolerance for the lie. They have the guts to do what is required to, to continue the journey. Obviously, there's nothing but awakening for them. In fact, their life is one you know, perpetual rite of passage and one perpetual uh, awakening process. However, the other group that might have been shaken up but have no real interest in waking up and who have no interest in doing what we're talking about, the real sacred work, the holy work of looking within themselves for the answers. Yeah, then uh, those people, and unfortunately they are the masses, you know, they're not going to go anywhere. They're, they're going to, in fact, have several um, reactions to this incoming plutonic light, if you will, Pluto being, again, a reference to these prophecies, because right now the planet Pluto is very operative in what's going on on a social level. And so even though the potential is there for social awakening, so to speak, although Pluto and Uranus, you know, the kind of archetypes that are working today, are again more about the shake-up. If you really want to be factual about uh, astrology, and unfortunately a lot of people are not being factual about it, they're making two broad statements, those archetypes, those planet archetypes, shake things up. And by shaking things up, uh, they primarily shake up the Saturnian and the Martian and even some of the solar embedded traditional approaches you know, and, and perspectives. But that, what that does is it gives the person then, it's just like sort of been loosening up from your chains, but you don't need to get up out of the prison and walk out. The door may be flung open, an earthquake may have happened and the, the whole prison is destroyed, but that doesn't still mean you've got up and walked outside the gates to be free. So there's still a little bit of a journey to go. Um, in which the, the awakening process must continue. Now, that, I believe, only happens on an individual level by people who have an innate understanding of where to go to find that information, uh, what to read, who to listen to, and so on, and what to do with it. And then the rest of the people who are sitting there going, tell me what to do. Well, that's not going to create any change. The whole change is about you finding out what you're about in your own individual life. I've said in previous, I've said in previous interviews, you know, that... Uh, Consciousness has been left at the door by almost every single par person in this alternative movement. Not all, granted, uh, but I would say I can, uh, I can still, even though I might give concession that some people still deal with consciousness, unfortunately they don't deal with the darker aspect of consciousness. So, uh, you know, I'm probably the only one in this movement that not only deals with consciousness per se, but with the darker aspect of consciousness, where with it, which is where this is all about. Because we're not going to be whole people unless we understand this whole psychological dynamic of what we don't face ourselves and what we do to avoid facing ourselves. I'm aware of, I'm totally aware of what people do to, to distract themselves. And I include in that the religions of the world and the New Age movement and many other things even in this movement. Distraction I'm fully aware of. Mm. But I know them as distraction. The individual is not an awakened until they themselves embody the Holy Spirit, embody the light in themselves, don't need it, don't, don't need it from external sources. And so this growing up period of maturity for individual spiritual psychological maturity, or I've also described it as a sort of psychic sovereignty or psychic immunity, where no pathogenic force can enter your consciousness because you're so strong, based on this martial arts principle that when you yourself are so inherently strong, right, that your enemy can't defeat you, well then you've won. But fighting the enemy with the tools that they've offered you, and, and, and fighting them along with a lot of other people equally disempowered and misguided as yourself, how could that possibly logically create you know, change in the world? It never has done, and it never will. So what do you think never. of this current global Occupy movement? What do you think that represents, and where do you think that could go? I don't, I don't have any interest in that. I think that these things will... I'm glad to see if they make some topical changes, or maybe on the lower street level, you know, some injustices are corrected. I'm all for that. And it's not that I don't believe in the power of a group. Let's, let's be factual about that. There's certainly enormous power in a group of well-meaning people. But when I speak of people being uh, psychologically infirm or psychologically uh, undeveloped, and that's what I do see, and I've seen it in all the movements of all the world, never has there been a movement. The one thing about coming together as a crowd is you not only maximize the power to do good, but you also maximize the power to misuse the power. 
In other words, like William Blake, the English poet, said that fist that crosses the tyrant's head becomes a tyrant in his stead. So unfortunately, in these movements of change, you find out that the, the, the group that takes over and, and douses one, you know, gives a knockout blow to one form of tyranny, often sets up another kind of tyranny afterwards. And so the person who's really studied these matters has very little faith in these movements at all, because we understand that those well-meaning individuals, if you will, there's been centuries of them, uh, our, I'm open to the fact that our time might be different in the sense that we have more learning now. Our forefathers, when they rose up with sword and fire, uh, were a little, not a little, but uh, drastically less educated in, in the architecture of power than, say, the people today. So I say that the, the changes that could happen today have one thing that never was in the past, which is learning, understanding of the matrix of power. We're far more up to speed on this than we ever have been in the past. And that gives us great hope. But at the same time, we have to factor in the fact that individuals, if they are themselves uh, alienated within themselves, if they're strangers to themselves on a psychological level, then unfortunately, the black sorcery can work its magic again. We're, we're, it's always, there's always going to be a, a mark to tyranny because of the individual is not a whole being within inside himself. He's still putting his faith in other people, his life is entirely motivated and changed and affected by what other people say, do, and think, including the society around him, you see. And this is not the way to gain a truly spiritualized, um, sovereign uh, civilization, which was the plan. That's why we're all here on this planet. We're not just here on this planet to simply uh, be altruistic and create a better mechanistic society or even a more... Um, uh, uh, easygoing set of sort of society. We're here to spiritually develop, and that can only happen on an individual level. Mm. This is this is the paradox. You may fix everything. You may decorate the world, and make it. Uh, uh, in fact, that's isn't isn't that the very motive of the globalists themselves? That they want to make everything safer and cleaner and brighter and, and longer living and all the rest. See, this is the whole thing. The ingredients are the same. So you could live in almost a perfect society and be desperately unhappy inside yourself. Because my focus, I mean, I can't talk about others and what they're doing, but the, the main focus for me is the, uh, is the idea of the psychic immunity of a person being whole within themselves, free within their mind. And therefore, even if that person is living in an utter tyranny, even if they happen to be incarcerated in the dungeon, they're still true. They're still full of light. They're still powerful human beings. You see? Because freedom is purely attitudinal. It will never, ever, at any time in history, ever be granted to you by an external force. No. And unfortunately, people are very affected by that. They really do believe that we just have the right person in power. You know, this is, this is nonsense. Psychologically, this is total, total, total suicide. Because there is no right person, and, there's no, and, and even if there was, there's nobody gets power, he'll abuse it. This is the message of history. The, in fact, the true man, right, the man, like the Taoists have always said, the wisest man will never take the power that you're offering him, for that very reason I've said. So you have a paradox here. You have a paradox, and I don't care if you change one father, you know, one over arc, uh, one over lord, one father figure for another. Yeah, I'm sure the costume changes continually, but the fact of the matter is, the same dynamics is there. So, you know, master above, slave below. But it's not that there's not injustices that need to be fixed, and I myself work as hard as I can to, to let those injustices be fixed, and I, I think of those movements are based on great knowledge that hey we need to change the legal system hey we got to stop all of these government you know machinations that's a completely different uh, you know concept and i'm behind it 100 percent all right first in line you know but my my knowledge of, of things has gone far deeper than just that social change social change comes with with social change comes many other uh deviant qualities you see because again consciousness itself is being left at the door so what are the what are the positive possibilities that we're we're dealing with in, in this time? Well, I think that what's happening now is that uh, we have two roads to go by. Hmm. The individual, as I said, uh, and you can almost divide the whole human race down the middle based on these paradigms. The individual who simply refuses to take care of their inner anxiety and and not do their psychological homework. Whether he likes it or not, and no matter how many boxes he ticks and who he votes for and uh, what money he donates and what placards he weighs, 
is heading straight like a, like a sheep into the global village. He will not be able to do anything about it because he is not spiritually raising any flag for the higher force to help him, basically. Mm -hmm. The other individual on the other side who's existentially empowered, has been doing his homework, understands why he's here on this planet. And that, yeah, 30, 40% of his energy should go into helping mankind, but you know, the rest of it should be helping himself and making sure he knows what, the, what his purpose on this existence is. That individual has unseen forces that come to help him. And it will be those unseen forces that matter a lot. Not that I'm saying like some new ager, just sit back, don't do anything, you know, Flash Gordon's on his way. I don't mean anything like that at all. <laughs> I mean, on the individual level, on the individual level, the individual is in tune with their oracle, with their higher guide. And that at any time or any season of the world, at any epoch in history, this is what is important for individuals, to have that existential sovereignty and that spiritual um, center. And, and to avoid all the forces you see, they try to compromise that, including the religions, the governments, and any of these nonsense about global diversity and global villages and utopia for everybody and all of this. A lot of these things are very alluring to the masses of mankind. A lot of people who are listening to us right now go, yeah, yeah, Michael, I understand you. But unfortunately, we're a minority. Hundreds of millions of people all over the world haven't got even the faintest idea of anything we're talking about and probably wouldn't even like it even if we did explain it to them. So these are individuals unfortunately, who are going to endorse and are doing it right now. They are buying these means. They're buying into this nonsense and they're voting for these creatures. And they're going to set up a situation which is infinitely worse than any sort of so-called fascism we've had. People today are not facing their so-called dark side. So you think the new, world old, you, the new world order is alive and well and we are very much on the verge of implementing it. And is that what you're saying? And But it's even oh, wow. actually, it's more than that. It's about who we become as a race as a result. Yeah. And as a species, okay. perhaps. Oh, yeah. The species is definitely going through a change. A very, very big one. A very, very big one. You know, our connection to nature, our connection to um, our own selves is, is at, a, at an absolute minimum right now. And a lot of the worldly things that take place are to attract us out to the surface again. They're to pull us outwards. And therefore, they know that man, by seeing social unrest, wants to get involved. He, he, he is also psychologically running from himself, so he, he wants to distance himself from his own spirit, his own soul. And the world is the perfect place to do that. He's hiding in the light. He's out there waving placards. Over what? Over the designer chaos that they have created to, to do precisely that? You know, my work on psychic vampirism, I say, Hey, you can always tell a psychic vampirism from one uh, psychic vampire in your life because he, he or she is the one you're going to, right? Check this out. Talk about a paradox. He or she is the one you're going to to rest your head on their breast to gain uh, uh, solace and comfort from the horrors that are besetting you because of their existence. Right? <laughs> the, the psychic vampires, when we go to say, help me, give me comfort, from the disasters that are taking place on my life on all levels, from you being in my life, but me not knowing that. Wonderful. Well, this is how it works on the higher level. These, these creatures, if we didn't have them, we'd be living completely sustainable lives and have a lot more happiness. Mm. They are the ones walking around. These are these specters in the night. These are the predators in the long grass who, while we're not looking, or, you know, sort of uh, as they distracted us and made us ignorant, go around creating unbelievable turmoil knowing full well that well-meaning, virtuous people will want to go and do something about it too sweet. Get in there and fix it, you see, and all of this. Okay, so your, your tour that you're about to do here in Australia is called The Architects of Control. And I guess you believe that at this point, we're at a point in time where these, these architects are about to completely implement their agenda. Is that, is that a correct assumption at this point? Yeah, exactly, and um, the talk is named that because it's uh, um, an investigation of the kind of control that they have going from the stuff that we're more familiar with into, into the, the deepest form of control that they have, and that's my forte, is to show how, uh, first of all, events that happen in even prehistoric days have given them their power. They got their power originally from some place and, uh, and uh, the power that they're able to manipulate over the human race. Uh, we can't break their control until we, are, we know what they know. You know, we've we got to sort of uh, go into that secret room and read the secret book to find out how did they get their control. I mean, what, what's going on? 
And part of that has to do with ancient trauma. I dealt with it in my very first writings back in the times when I did my Atlantis book, and I've been working on it ever since. In that book, I dealt with the question of evil. And so these talks that we're doing now uh, continue that investigation. You know, the, the, the investigation into what evil is is not a simple matter at all and takes us into very many fields. And in fact, this, even this um, tour, this age of manipulation tour, is threefold. The first one we're doing, then we do psychic vampirism next, which again looks at the question of evil even in a more deeper way, yet again from a totally different perspective. This time, how it affects you, even your most individual personal life and also your relationships that you've had with your parents and your, your various partners and even the business workmates and the people in general, you see. So we, we take it, it's a large thesis, and then there's even a third one after that that will look at another aspect of it. So I think that uh, you asked earlier about sort of implying whether I'm optimistic or not. The information that I'm dealing with now, if I, I believe personally, uh, you know, uh, uh, that if it is embodied, if people really get their minds around what these studies that I'll be sharing with people, then I believe incredibly radical change will take place. I really do believe that. Becoming symbol literate, I think was the term you used. Um, is that, am I true in, in saying that you think it's one of the most important and first steps that we must, we must make so that we can, yeah. we can identify when perhaps we're being triggered for one? Yes, and definitely. manipulated. So, how does one become symbol literate? Um, there's various ways. I mean, I've done a lot of work on it to help people along, and now there's a huge uh, research. I mean, after my work came out, people took to it massively, and now you see a lot of things on it. It's just uh, again, it's very important because it's also again part of the spiritual development. As I said, these people manipulate symbols that are really not their own in the first place. You know, I've got a book coming out next year called Trees of Life, and that thesis goes in to show you that almost every symbol that masonry and religion use originally came from the highest keepers of truth that the planet has ever known, the wisest man, the wisest cult, and that has been completely corrupted and misused. So by studying symbolism, we take it back. What we're really doing is good people are taking it back. You know, an artist, a painter, a designer, uh, a filmmaker. Now when they're using these symbols and they think, oh, I want to use this symbol, you know, now they're really going to know. If they study my work, they're really going to know why they're using it and what it symbolizes. Or people may have their, have their favorite paintings or favorite images all their life without even knowing why. So when you study the symbols or even the musical notes, you know, the, the, the kind of music they like or the clothes they kind of wear, or the colors they choose, you know, there's all reasons for this. And so it's very important to know um, why we like that, uh, where, these, where these archetypes come from. And it is very much a first step, that's true. It's actually an ongoing study like every great study is, but it is the early stages. I had to start doing work on it in public early because where we are now, I knew that we're never going to get anyone there unless we first you know, put in some of the basics. And so I started with the symbol literacy, number one, because it hadn't been done before with any kind of, you know, with any kind of professionalism. That was what worried me. And secondly, because it was necessary. So that once people are up to speed on that, because remember, if you're studying symbolism and talking about it, you can actually get into a lot of other fields from just studying that. It's a very eclectic field. And mm. you know, we get into talking about secret societies and satanic orders and you know, all sorts of interesting aspects, uh, psychology, astrology, uh, corporate logos, uh, social, social injustice. You know, there's so many things that you can visit, TV programs, archetypes. You know, in my DVD on it, we looked at the Star Trek. Uh, series and you know the archetypal the, like just the numbers of the figures the famous archetypal dynamics and so on and this helps people if they themselves are going to work on stage or produce plays or even produce movies and and uh, and productions you see you need to know some of these key archetypes I mean right down to the look of the individuals whether they're thin or fat whether they're short or tall the colors they wear you know um, all sorts of interesting facets this, so so studying symbols goes into Many, many interesting things. It includes the study of numerology, sacred geometry. You can't talk about symbolism, you see, without opening a huge, huge interesting vista of information. And so I thought that that would be the most interesting in the beginning for people, and it turned out to be right. They were. And then from that point, you can then go on to modulate it and move out into other subject matter as we've done. And my hope was that it would get to the point where we'd be doing some of the more philosophical, psychological work that you know, I'm doing now, and it's, it's come to pass. So I'm, in fact, this Australian tour for me is a very important event milestone because of this very fact that it will be um, 
like we did in architects of control or the DVD, taking it to the next step and getting even deeper now. I, 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 I advertised this myself and mentioned it as a sort of an advanced class in some of the stuff that I've already done in the past, you know, and, and laid down the foundations. Now we get into the deeper, uh, deeper aspects of it, the deeper sort of uh, secrets of it. I think that that's going to leave a lot of people at the door. It's not for everyone. I know that. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm all right with that, you know, because again, I don't, I don't look to large groups and, and large crowds of people getting into this information. Not at all. It's about select people who are really deadly serious. So do you think yeah. that people need to be familiar with your work specifically in order to come along on this tour and get something out of it? Or do they need, what, what level of, of education in what areas do they, do they need in order to be able to walk but, away from this? With, uh, yeah, they, don't need, they don't need much background for this one because one of, for the first hour is a recap uh -huh. of the very most important points that I've been dealing with for years now. And also, and I think if they want to recap, just watch Architects and Control the DVD. Everything, that was the first installment, basically, where we're going. So they won't need to watch more than that to have a very, very good grasp of where we're going with this. Maybe a couple of interviews or whatever. But it's not really necessary because in the first hour, I'm going to be sort of reca recapitulating. Um, the, the, the talk itself is like in about four sections, four or five sections with breaks in between. And the first section uh, is a is a overview generally and in fact it's more than that it's got some crucially new things in it as well by the way but it has um it's mostly going to uh, summarize some of the stuff i've done before then we move into a couple of more specific areas in the talk and then try to get quickly what i've done i've tried to be very specific about how this talk is arranged because i want the bulk of it in time to deal with solutions and it's not that I haven't had time to do solutions before. I think I've done a marvelous job on that. But the trouble is it's the venue. It's the actual talk itself. At other talks, when you're not doing it on your own, you barely have a one hour, 50 minutes, and perhaps two hours to talk. So obviously, right, trying to cram many solutions into like the last half an hour or something <laughs> like that just is extremely dissatisfactory. And I've done better work, of course, in my DVDs and so on. But I, and when I now get up on stage, is I don't do a lot of public talks because um, I have difficulty working with the people who put them on. But the thing is that if, like Adam, is guy of integrity, you want to do it, I'll go ahead. But then I want to make sure, especially now, that the entire day is mine. I, I, we don't have to have breaks. Uh, excuse me, I didn't mean have breaks. I mean other, other, other people up there, you know, so I can have a, a long enough time to have a beginning, middle, and end and then have the extra focus, a larger chunk of time, I mean three hours and plus, to really get into the solution so that nobody can leave the hall without knowing exactly what they need to do. And there's a section on children, which I think is incredibly valuable. I did the talk already. We did it in uh, London and previously in Manchester, and it was mind-boggling. People absolutely loved it, and especially this part on children. We've got that in the, in the solution section. Can't be brushed over quickly. You know, we need the time for that. So the whole thing has uh, been measured nicely, that if we do get that whole, you know, we do something that's all day long, uh, it'll be very good for this to get down to the solutions at the end. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, sure, we're, it's really not important for anyone to have previous, they, believe me, this is jam-packed with information. You're going to have more information from this talk than you could want. You know, you wouldn't need to watch other stuff previously. In fact, if you listen to this talk, going back to my previous stuff is even going to make better sense. By the people who come to this talk and see it, mm. you know, when they do go back and look at Architects of Control or even way, way, way back to 2006 or whatever, to Origins of Evil and uh, the 2012 Future of Mankind. In fact, almost everything I've done is going to now change in complexion. When people look back at my work, they're going to see what I was doing back then and they're going to understand more of why those ingredients are in there, you know, at, at the end when they see when you look back, do you see that the, this was leading to this, or was it leading to this on a conscious level, or you can look back at it and see the evolution of it, of your work? Uh, it's been deliberate from day one. It's, it, everything's been a, an unbelievably methodical and very, very arduous and long-term process. That's all I can say. I mean, it's, it's just been very, very... I've taken many professional risks. I've turned down umpteen gigs. Uh, I've, I've had to follow the flow and work on things, a great 
effort, uh, uh, taking professional risks, meaning that, you know, one guy likes you out there, that kind of thing, you know, the rest of them couldn't give a monkeys. You know, I've taken those kinds of risks in order to uh, organize what I'm doing in such a way that it not only works for me, but it is moving towards this larger, you know, you cannot have somebody just dive into the depths right away. You've got to teach them in the shallows where it's safe and so on and introduce these subjects slowly, slowly, slowly. I've been studying these all my life, but when you come to be in the, in the public eye and when you come to care about the fact that, you know, people are not up to speed with any of this stuff, they're immensely background, backward in a lot of this stuff, it's completely new to them, you have to, like a teacher does at the beginning of this, of this season or semester or whatever, just break it down and move from the beginning to the middle to the end. And I'm a lover of articulation. I like a thing to have a beginning, middle, and end. You know, that's what, that's what everything in life is all about. I don't care if you're playing an instrument or whatever. There's a natural law, a natural progression of the beginning, middle, and end. And I knew that the theor theories and the teachings that I, I want to get to are very, very complex. I'm not going to chop it up small and make it spin a rack for people in the beginning like the whole New Age movement has done. I'm not going to do that because these are beloved subjects of mine. I love the knowledge. And I'm not going to cut it up so that every Joe Schmo can get it. I'm going to deliver it to people who are educated and intelligent and up to speed. And I'm going to do it with uh, some sort of... Uh, honor to where those ideas come from right and that meant starting in the beginning with simpler stuff moving up and so that when you finally deliver the you know the main stuff you do it in a proper serving you do it with respect and you don't do it by uh, by trying to think that you know i need to make this as palatable as possible so that every you know zombified person is going to get it i've never worked in that way because i think that's completely a, a immoral way to work and so i've had to take many many professional risks all the way down the line in order to do it this way but I always knew that it would, it, would, it would work because I know that the time is right. And I know that the, the psyche of, of decent moral uh, people want to know the truth. And they're having, moving up to the aspect now where they know what they don't want. And they know they have zero tolerance for the lie. And, then, and if that time has come, then so be it. Well, I look forward to spending, uh, spending a day listening to you talk for eight hours or so, nine hours or so. Um, when, you, when you do come next month. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, Michael, um, and I look forward to catching up with you in person soon when, you, when you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'd be glad to see you, and again, it'd be lovely to come down to Australia. It'll be my first visit there, so I'm really enthusiastic about being there, you know, and meeting everyone. It's really great. Thank you. Thanks a lot.